So today we're very fortunate to have uh, Margaret Salmon as our seminar speaker. Some of you may remember she's uh, back for an encore presentation from just a few years ago. Um, Dr. Salmon and I met maybe 10 years ago, uh, similar interests of which you'll see uh, um, some of that work here today. I'd like to ask you to take a moment uh, to silence and store your cell phones, uh, and let's see if something emergent that you think might come up. So uh, Dr. Salmon uh, did her bachelor's degree at uh, um, uh, University of Detroit in Michigan, uh, and then her uh, doctoral work at uh, Wayne State, also uh, in Detroit. Then went on and did some, spent some time in industry that we'll probably hear a little bit about, uh, and uh, um, did uh, fellowships in d different areas, uh, cardiology, pediatric cardiology, and also uh, radiology out in Boston for a while. She publishes in all, all the best journals, and uh, you'll see a lot of that work here today. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask you to please help me uh, welcome Dr. Margaret Salmon. Well, I'd like to thank John and the group here. I don't know if you can hear me with this. I'd like to thank John and the group for inviting me to speak. It's been a, a really nice collaboration. It's hard to believe it's been 10 years, John. Neither one of us are getting any older, right? <laughs> so I am basically a clinician who is going to talk with you about computational modeling from congenital heart disease really to more acquired heart disease. I have no relevant financial disclosures and some of the work was um, from a research grant that we got at Children's Hospital. Um, I do on an average day see patients most of the time and I do kind of research as my hobby, I guess. Um, the, the agenda will start with some background information about atherosclerosis and early risk factors. Then I'll introduce you to computational modeling. You may know more about it than I do or did at the time when I learned this. Um, computational modeling with regard to atherosclerosis, and then we'll talk about our pilot pediatric study in diabetic children and some ongoing research in future directions. So without further ado, um, this is a slide that became very um, uh, pertinent for me. Um, you know, I trained as a cardiologist um, at uh, Michigan and the University of Iowa, and then I went right into industry, and we were developing drugs to deal with atherosclerosis, and I was amazed that on my day-to-day -day basis, even now, I, I take care of congenital heart disease, 1.3 million people with congenital heart disease. But m more people have actually coronary disease, over 15 million Americans, with many people having the risk factors, over 70 million with hypertension, 140 that are overweight and obese, um, 40,000 or so with hypercholesterolemia, and uh, 20 million with diabetes, kind of a striking number, and we'll come back to this in a moment. Um, so this is something that I've been worried about for a, a number of years, and this cartoon comes from Braunwald's textbook on uh, atherosclerosis and its development. I think all of you know that LDL cluster is kind of a bad thing. You don't want to have that around, and that helps to, um, to form plaque. And there are actually a number of different processes from oxidation of LDL particles to uh, disruption of the, uh, the vascular endothelium um, to the disruption of the internal elastic lamina. Interestingly, white cells become involved, monocytes and macrophages become involved and, and scavenge up these oxidized particles um, such that then there is soon uh, more inflammatory processes and the smooth muscle cells get involved. Uh, and we, we start to have the beginnings of plaque even in kids. There have been autopsy studies done in Bogalusa where children died for other reasons and they looked at the, the children's uh, coronary arteries and at their aorta and they already had plaque and fatty streaks. So it is something that is modifiable. Uh, as we'll see, uh, and it's something that can be studied even early on before there is uh, demonstrable uh, plaque that can cause ischemia. All right, so this is um, kind of how plaque develops. It's a, an evolutionary process over many, many years. First, plaque actually encroaches on the, uh, the wall uh, and builds into the wall, into the elastic lamina, through the uh, intima, into the media, and out into the adventitia. And soon as you have a, a plaque burden of more than about 40%, it'll actually encroach upon the, the vessel. And with 60% stenosis, you can have some symptoms. So you could have angina and chest pain. You could actually have myocardial ischemia or an infarct. You could have cerebral vascular accident or stroke. Uh, or you could have peripheral vascular disease, claudication or rest pain. And we probably, each one of us in this audience, know somebody personally who has had that happen. So this is a, a very big problem. Um, I became interested in atherosclerosis when I was a fellow at the University of Iowa. So, you know, after you do training in pediatrics, you have to spend another three years learning how to be a cardiologist. And my mentor, the late Ron Lauer, had a huge uh, grant for this, the center. And he studied children in Muscatine, Iowa, a little town on the Mississippi River where nobody ever moves. And so it's a great cohort to have a serial longitudinal study. 
And during one of the biennial surveys that he did in Muscatine, he looked at kids between 8 and 18 and looked for risk factors and kind of measured how big are they, what's their blood pressure, what's their LDL cholesterol, and then followed them for years. So when I showed up in the 1990s, part of my project was to look at their coronary arteries by CT scanning. It was one of the first times people had done CT scans to look at calcium for a mature plaque. And it was kind of interesting that Ron had this, this captive audience of 200 subjects that were male and about 200 subjects that were female that he could then look back and say, what was their body mass index? What was their blood pressure? And how does that relate to uh, their internal medial thickness, a measure by ultrasound of how thick the wall is, and to uh, their coronary calcium scores. So he found that risk factors for intimal medial thickness um, that uh, would be a precursor to plaque would be LDL, not surprisingly, in smoking in men, and LDL and systolic blood pressure in women. Uh, and the prevalence was actually sort of high. It was a third of the men. I mean, these are young guys. A third of the men already had coronary calcium scores. Not very many women, and we know that estrogen is protective against atherosclerosis, so not too surprising. And not too surprising that the calcium score was significantly associated with an elevated intimal medial thickness. Finally, looking back at the kids, you could see that even if you were obese as a child or had high blood pressure as a child or low HDL as a kid, this had um, bearing on whether or not you would have uh, calcium scores that were high or early signs of atherosclerosis. So bearing this in mind, I went then from fellowship back into industry, and I worked at Pfizer and Park Davis for about five years. Uh, I was involved in some gene therapy trials to, grow, to try to grow new blood vessels in people who couldn't have bypass, and one of the tricky populations were diabetic patients. They have uh, vessels that are very hard to bypass. I spent about five years in industry and always missed my patients, and so ended up going back to the University of Florida. And one of the first people I met at Florida was the senior, uh, the first author on this, Mike Haller, and the senior author is Janet Silverstein, a very um, senior person who's well NIH funded and sits on a number of uh, section uh, for grant review at the NIH. And she had an interest in diabetic kids. And uh, before this, I really wasn't that interested, except that I had heard in industry that diabetics were a real problem. They, they have more atherosclerosis and their vessels are really tiny. So we took advantage of the warm weather in Florida, and there's a, a great camp system for kids who have disease. And we actually went out to the camp, the diabetic camp, and recruited a bunch of children with diabetes. So we had almost 100 kids with diabetes between the ages of 10 and 18, and then some healthy controls from regular pediatric offices. From that, we ended up with 43 matched pairs. They were matched based on their age, their gender, their race, and their body mass index. They could not have any known cardiovascular disease and could not be on any either antihypertensive agents or lipid-lowering agents because we wanted to study truly the effects of diabetes on vascular health. And so we performed something called radial tonometry, which I'll show you in the next two slides what, what that means, because it really is an engineering-based uh, concept for looking at vascular health. And we checked some traditional labs, both with regard to their diabetes as well as lipid profile uh, and uh, inflammatory markers, because inflammation is associated with the development of atherosclerosis. In our results, in our little uh, cohort of diabetic children, they had increased arterial stiffness even at this young age. Uh, was very dramatically different than the, the other um, children who did not have diabetes. So what is radial tonometry? Um, this is a, um, if you Google it or PubMed search it, you'll see hundreds of articles where people use radial tonometry to look at vascular health. It's a measure of the, the elasticity, if you will, of the radial artery, and that's kind of a biomarker for what's happening centrally. In fact, one of the authors says there's a trove of information that can be gleaned from the shape, the amplitude, and the duration of the waveform that provides insights into the diagnosis and management of many disease states, including hypertension, coronary artery disease, obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, and diastolic dysfunction. So it's amazing that this one technique can show you so many things. What you develop is something called an augmentation index, and it is and has been so associated with cardiovascular risk. I'll show you what, how you get that in a moment. It also uh, predicts the presence or absence of uh, coronary artery disease in terms of plaque and it's an independent predictor of not only events like heart attack, but also of death. Uh, so pretty uh, compelling data from a little tiny device that just looks like this. Um, you apply it over the radial artery and it generates a curve, and we'll talk more about that momentarily. So this is how it's used. It looks like a pencil. It's uh, very portable, which is why it's attractive to take to a camp or to an, uh, a scenario where you have lots of patients coming in. You can generate um, a waveform. It's a radial arterial waveform. 
You look for a quality index of over 80 to tell you that you're in the right position and that the data is, uh, has good integrity. And this then can allow you to calculate a central waveform uh, using a mathematical equation uh, that involves uh, fast Fourier transformation. And this is actually FDA approved, um, so it actually applies, uh, it can predict central pressure waveform, and that has been shown in cardiac catheterization studies where they had a central pr pressure in the aorta with a catheter sitting in a patient's aorta, and they correlated this with their radial tonometry. So a very strong uh, uh, scenario. Um, you calculate this augmentation index, it's simply the ratio between um, the second inflection point pressure, um, shown on this little graph here, and the first, that's the difference between those, um, divided by the, the pulse pressure, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. So a very simple measure, but it has a lot of clinical implication and is used a lot in the adult world. Um, moving on a little bit, people think, oh, you're too far away from the central vasculature out the radial artery. So there's another way to look at vascular health, and you can look at brachial artery reactivity. As shown in this patient, we have some mobile equipment available at Freydert at our, their lab. There are many, many publications about the use of this for vascular health. You simply uh, measure the, the, um, the brachial artery, you measure its diameter, you inflate the cuff for five minutes, you let the cuff go down, and then you measure it again. And vessels that are healthy will dilate. A sick vessel will not dilate. So as people age, their brachial artery reactivity declines. And in fact, this is also a marker of atherosclerosis or the early changes leading to vascular uh, disease. So with bearing that in mind, during my course of uh, learning, I became acquainted with MRI. Um, first in industry, when they asked me to be involved with an HDL elevator and the primary endpoint was going to be MRI, and I knew nothing about it, and yet I was in charge of it. And so I was sent out to meet with Dr. Yuan in uh, Seattle, and he's a radiologist who does a lot of imaging of carotid arteries, and then compares the images by MRI. These are cross-sectional pictures of the carotid artery, and you then compare it with histologic specimens because the patients were undergoing carotid endarterectomy. So he could actually tell us, hey, this is what the signal should look like in MRI, and it correlates with uh, a calcium um, uh, plaque, and this is one that's fibrous rich but doesn't have any calcium. So MRI understand, offers an understanding of tissue characteristics and is really far superior to either of those indirect measures of vascular health, whether it's radial tonometry or brachial artery reactivity. And there is actually a high reproducibility that exists for MRI, or CMR is what we call it, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, for aortic plaque in adults with coronary disease. And people use the aorta as a surrogate for the coronary arteries because the coronary arteries are so small that it's very hard uh, to get uh, precise images of the plaque in coronary arteries, although there is work in that area as well. Measurements of thoracic uh, luminal area, luminal circumference, plaque area, and plaque perimeter are very highly correlated upon multiple scans. So kind of an intriguing thing. And I kind of was thinking about this as I was looking at my diabetic kids, and, and certainly as when I met John, and, and I do MRI as a, uh, a clinician for uh, diagnosing congenital heart disease, but I had in the back of my mind, I wonder if we could measure early plaque in kids or vascular health in kids with MRI. So now we'll t move on to computational modeling. So that's my background, and I then move here in 2006 with my husband who works at GE, and um, one of my colleagues said, hey, can you go down and talk to John Ladisa? He's at Marquette, and they'd like to collaborate. And so John mentioned computational modeling and seemed very familiar with it, and to me it was Greek. I didn't know anything about it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I sure I can help you. Um, uh, tell me a little bit more about it, and I feel like I've learned an awful lot from a lot of people who have become friends. Uh, certainly John has run a, a really wonderful lab and uh, has many successful uh, trainees. Um, I, Dave Wendell I just saw last week at the MRI meeting in Los Angeles. He's very, uh, doing very well at Duke. Um, Ronick Delaki is in New York and then um, Laura Elwin is down in Virginia. So John has uh, started a legacy of people who are really carrying on the work of computational modeling very nicely. John showed me this picture, and I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? I've been studying blood vessels for a long time, and I hadn't realized that it's really this beautiful pattern of swirling that happens in the aorta. It's just like, wow, I wonder what that means and what that's going to have bearing on for disease for these patients. Um, and computational modeling, if you look up computational fluid dynamics, you get some really interesting pictures off the Internet. It is um, 
everywhere. It's just like everywhere. Um, this is a technique that's used in the study of fluid mechanics, whether that fluid is blood, in my case, or whether it's air for aerodynamics with NASA or for the auto industry. I'm from Detroit, so I love this picture. Uh, or I even found one with regard to farming. Uh, and so it really is just the study of fluid, and it's using numerical analysis and algorithms to solve and to analyze problems that involve flow. Um, so my introdu introduction to computational fluid dynamic modeling uh, involved um, just getting images. And so when I look at this little algorithm, this is sort of, for me, the basic process of what happens. Uh, the patient's in the MRI scanner, and John needs me to give him uh, data that shows anatomy and data that shows flow. Um, he will then reconstruct it using some segmentation. It looks almost like chicken wire. And as I understand it, this chicken wire allows you then to apply mathematical formulas to different small little segments where the, the flow is relatively um, constant, and you're not trying to um, apply it to the whole aorta at the same time. And so you can build a model. We provide him with flow information, and we'll show you that in a moment, and then some blood pressure information, and he runs some high-tech uh, computational simulations. For us, um, the first time I was exposed to it in congenital heart disease with, was with patients who were born with a single ventricle. So believe it or not, there are some unfortunate children who have, uh, when they're born, they only have one pumping chamber. They can either have hypoplastic left heart uh, or they can have um, hypoplastic right heart. And in either case, the surgeons will um, palliate them with a number of operations to give them a pump that pumps to their body. And their blood flow to their lungs is passive and dependent upon circuits that the surgeon has created. And that circuit, this is, shows you a picture of the circuit. It's called the Fontan. Uh, this is an extra cardiac variety. There have been many modifications over the years as people look at flow. And it connects the superior vena cava with the inferior vena cava, and these are then connected into the lung arteries so that the flow into the lung arteries is passive without a pump. The pump are your legs as you're walking along. So you can imagine the flow dynamics are very interesting to people. And in the last 10 to 15 years, people have been doing computational modeling to look at flow dynamics, with the goal being to have less turbulent flow so that there's less energy loss and you can get the blood where you want it to go. Um, you want less stasis so that you don't have a clot, because a clot in this circuit leads to a pulmonary embolus, which can kill a patient. So very important. And then um, we don't yet know but why, but hepatic blood is very important for uh, the lungs to see. Uh, it, people who do not see hepatic blood flow, let's say it's directed to one side versus the other, you'll develop collaterals on the side that does not have hepatic blood flow. And we don't know why. We don't know what feature it is. But distributing this more evenly has actually led surgeons in San Francisco to change the dimension of this Fontan to create a Y graft to try to solve some of these problems. So you can see that engineering and computational fluid dynamic modeling specifically has affected the way surgeons do things. Kind of interesting. So this is a diagram that I borrowed from John. Um, and uh, it's just to show you, again, what we provide him with is an MRA. Uh, we give patients gadolinium. We get a 3D rendering of whatever vasculature he would like to study. And John's been very interested in, in aortas. So so consequently, I'm interested in aortas as well. And then we provide him with flow data. And flow data in MRI is just cross-sectional flow. We need some in inlets, uh, flow from the aorta, and all the major egresses, the brachiocephalic vessels and the descending thoracic aorta, ignoring the intercostal vessels. Um, and that is what is required for modeling. Um, our first collaborative project was a computational simulation done to look at patients who had coarctation of the aorta. So shown here is an MRA from an unfortunate patient who um, was diagnosed late with coarctation. Most of patients nowadays are diagnosed early at birth or shortly thereafter. But it, it demonstrates for you that the aortic arch should look like a nice candy cane, as shown here in the control patients. But in a patient with coarctation, they have a significant narrowing, usually just distal to the left subclavian artery. And so blood has to really accelerate through there. The vessels above are seeing very high pressures. That includes the vessels that go to the head, and people can stroke with coarctation of the aorta. Um, and, and the heart is seeing a really high pressure and can hypertrophy and can ultimately fail. So the surgeon will cut out this coarcted segment and then create a repair. There are a lot of ways to do this. John was most interested in studying those patients with end-to-end -end anastomosis, and so that's what we did because we had lots of patients who had had that kind of repair who were coming back to us. And they come back because sometimes if they're operated on before a year of age, they can have restenosis. Um, 
They come back because they could have developed a dissection, very rare, or they could have an aneurysm. Um, so we studied a lot of those patients. And so John used this to create models for each of the patients, which we'll show you in a moment. But these are the velocity maps, and these are the time average wall shear stress maps. And at the time when we did this project, I will have to admit that time average wall shear stress was, again, like Greek to me. And I had to do a lot of um, reading about that. So I'll have a couple slides to try to explain what, at least how a clinician views time average wall shear stress. Um, so um, you know, the only flow measurements I provided to Marquette were inflow measurements and outflow measurements. And yet somehow or other, John was able to create this model of velocity. Um, using that discretized uh, method that we sh showed you. So we gave him um, a few areas of data, and then he was able to model flow anywhere along the entire 3D volume set, which was to me was sort of interesting. It's like, wow, isn't that interesting? There were some assumptions made with regard to vascular compliance, uh, but even still, it's better than what we would have had uh, without this modeling. Pressure measurements can be assessed as well. This time average wall shear stress is showing you that some areas seem to have higher stress, areas of of tight curvatures tend to have higher stress and, and turns, and then wall displacement. So it's easy to imagine that this might be involved in the development of complications postoperatively, whether it's restenosis or aneurysm. And certainly adult studies have suggested that wall shear stress has bearing on the development of atherosclerosis, which I was intrigued about because of all the stuff we just talked about, right? Um, so, nice little breather as we go into now, what do I know about computational modeling? I'm a clinician, I really like to see patients, but the engineering part of it is still very interesting to me. Um, my undergrad is University of Detroit is a brother school to Marquette and is another Jesuit school, and I certainly loved taking classes with the engineers, and so it was very interesting to go back and read about what is wall shear stress. And so as I understand it, wall shear stress is actually different than wall stress. Um, and so this represents circumferential and longitudinal frictional force exerted against the wall. If you will, it's almost as if your hand uh, is the blood and it's swirling along and swirling along and as it hits the wall, it has a stress against the wall that is a shearing stress, if you will, uh, as opposed to a, a t wall tension. So a little bit different. Uh, the equations to calculate it are different. And what, so what we're talking about for atherosclerosis is this shear stress. And it has to do with the viscosity of the blood, the blood flow rate, the radius of the vessel, and then a shrinkage index. Um, and so, and then John talked about something called oscillatory shear index, and I, all I could think of was an old oscilloscope from old movies where you see the um, oscillations of something. And so that is exactly what it is. It's shear stress that is in different directions. And so it's just a way to characterize the different directions of shear flow. And, and uh, we'll talk about how that pertains to atherosclerosis in a moment. So going back to that beautiful picture um, that I saw 10 years ago now, I kind of wondered, uh, actually in preparing this talk, I thought, well, what, what do people say about this helical flow? Does it really have bearing on disease? And indeed it does. It plays several positive physiologic roles. It facilitates blood flow transport and suppresses disturbed blood flow. It prevents the accumulation of all those atherogenic uh, products because they're swirling along and they don't have time to sit there and incorporate into the vessel wall. Um, at the same time, it's enhancing oxygen transport. Uh, interestingly, blood vessels are not just a single lumen, but they're really quite complex. They have an intima, a media made of muscle, and an adventitia. And oxygen needs to actually get in there to maintain the health of the blood vessel. So the swirling flow helps that to happen. And then finally, it reduces the adhesion of things that bear on, on uh, the development of plaque, platelets, and monocytes. So helical blood flow may protect arteries from the pathologic mechanisms of atherosclerosis, thrombosis, and intimal hyperplasia. Kind of important stuff. I went back historically to look at how long did it take people to figure this out. And there have been a number of really interesting um, experiments. I can't give you all of them, but I, I know for a couple of years I was insisting to John that it had to be high time average wall shear stress had to be the thing that was related to plaque. And John was like, no, Margaret, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong. And he was right. I was completely um, wrong. But it's interesting that other people thought this too. Way back in the 1960s, they took a bunch of dogs and they subjected that, their arteries to really high non-physiologic stress. And those um, 
Th those stresses, and this is quite high, you can see the maximum human wall shear stress is less than 100. But in this case, uh, they damaged the endothelium and they postulated this must be the mechanism for plaque formation. It must be that it's a healing process and then uh, plaque builds up and, and you have this fibrosis. But that turns out to have been refuted many years later because in human beings and in animals, you never get to that high level of wall shear stress. And so another set of experiments were done. This is a, a, supposed to be a glass model. And um, these uh, gentlemen uh, went and uh, took cadaver specimens, kind of interesting. They went to the morgue and, and asked for the cadavers of people who had died and looked at the carotid arteries and created models uh, from angiograms that they did on the cadavers. So they did the picture, they did an angiogram um, using a catheter and um, dye, and then from that created a model. And they could look at, this was a plaque that had been there, so there's a narrower lumen for flow. Uh, and they could look at what were the flow dynamics when they did uh, phantom flow assessments in these blown glass and plexiglass models, and how did it compare with where the plaque actually was in the patients? Um, and so they, f and that they had histology, obviously, right? They had the cadavers. And so they found that regions of low wall shear stress were most susceptible to atherosclerosis. And so that has been borne out many, many times by lots of different people looking at atherosclerosis. Um, so by the 1990s, many people recognized that both low mean wall shear stress and high oscillatory shear index contribute to an increased fluid residence time in the carotid sinus or in other areas of bifurcations, allowing for the mass transport of these atherogenic substances. So very, very important. Um, and bloodborne cellular elements have a longer residence time, and so you actually can damage the vessel in that regard. So it's kind of a busy slide, but I wanted to walk you through it because it's one of the first adult studies looking at thoracic aortic plaque, and it has bearing on how we analyzed our data. So this is the aortic arch, and they looked at different levels along the aortic arch, different segments uh, that they were going to image by MRI. They did an MRI image, and then they realized that different regions of the circumference may not actually be the same. And so they should look at it in a quadra you know, almost in a uh, uh, quadratic way. This is one quadrant, the next, the next. And so they had um, plaque volume, and you can see it changes as you go from slice to slice, so it's not the same. It's very heterogeneous, um, and that's highest plaque volume in these quadrants that are colored in orange. And then as you go down, the, the wall stress also changes as you go down, with areas of low wall shear stress most often accompanied by uh, plaque as detected by MRI. And so in our methods, which we'll show you uh, for our diabetic study, uh, we, that's exactly how we looked at the data. Um, another interesting study, just to um, really proved to me that yes, everybody thinks that low wall shear stress is associated with plaque. There was an early study of infrarenal aortas, and people are always looking for surrogates for the coronaries. Coronaries are hard to image. The heart's moving, the coronaries are moving, they're really tiny. So they looked at the infrarenal aorta for plaque, and again, low wall mean shear stress, high index, shear index, predisposed to plaque. Um, and uh, well, the regions that have high wall shear stress are relatively spared. And in fact, if you look at a plaque, the plaque volume is usually the highest in the middle. These are very typical of what you would see on intravascular ultrasound if you looked at a plaque. It would have these sharp um, edges, and people actually think that these are the regions where the plaque can rupture and can lead to an acute heart attack. So acute coronary syndrome is from <coughs> rupture of a plaque, and you can imagine why there's higher wall shear stress at these um, sloping areas. Um, so in an adult coronary study, they did a similar thing with coronary arteries and looked at two millimeter segments to look at the coronaries and again saw that areas with lower wall shear stress had more established plaque and that the wall shear stress even varies around the plaque. So kind of interesting. Uh, so looking through, and, and when I met John, he had already been uh, collaborating with uh, Ray Magrino over at Freighter, and this is a study that you guys did, I think, um, similar to the, the last study where they're looking at surrogates and uh, similar to that animal, uh, or the cadaveric study, they looked at carotids. And so the first uh, picture is looking at different, these are on the x-axis are the different locations along the carotid as imaged by MRI, and MRI is very good at tissue characterization, so you can actually tell what are the components of the plaque. And you can see there's a relatively high volume of plaque in slices about 10 to 15, and it's at certain circumferential locations, so keep that in mind. And then you go over here and you look at the wall shear stress as modeled by Marquette's lab, and the wall shear stress was fairly low in the areas of high plaque, and the oscillatory shear index relatively high. So kind of interesting and very consistent with what has been published by other people. Um, so I 
cogitated about this for a while, I was taking care of my patients, thinking about it, and then thinking about all those diabetic kids I had met in Florida. I thought, I wonder if we could study our diabetic kids with computational modeling. And so we recently published in May um, what was a very lengthy um, study in terms of recruitment and, and getting the data. Uh, it's hard to do a prospective study. And so the aim of this study, or the significance, is that we risk factors begin in childhood. And so vascular changes do too, based on the Bogalusa autopsy study of kids who had died for other reasons. They saw fatty streaks. Computational fluid modeling studies are mostly in adults. There are very few that have been done in children. So we hypothesized that pediatric patients with type 1 diabetes, those are insulin-dependent children, would have uh, cardiac magnetic resonance imaging-derived computational models showing differences in thoracic aortic wall shear stress, oscillatory shear index when compared with control subjects who have no diabetes. Um, the primary aim was to determine the feasibility of doing this prospective study. Um, we had a lot of considerations, right? I, I needed to look at vascular health with brachial artery reactivity testing or radial tonometry that's best done when the kids are fasting. So I had to be conscious of what is the sugar on this patient who's diabetic. Am I gonna, is the length of my study gonna put this child in jeopardy? So it was really a feasibility trial. Um, and then we wanted to see if we could give John appropriate 3D data that did not use gadolinium because my IRB would not allow me to give gadolinium, which is not approved for use in cardiac imaging, to children who didn't need to have a cardiac scan. And interestingly, just at last week's SCMR meeting in Los Angeles, people are talking about the potential side effects of GAD, and there have been some people who have seen GAD um, uptake in the brain um, in patients who are even receiving it clinically. So one of my colleagues from Boston said, you know what, we need to develop new pulse sequences where we can get 3D data sets without gadolinium. It is unacceptable to have any retention of GAD. So this will have bearing later on, I think, in the next five to 10 years, where people will be doing 3D data sets without gadolinium. So the first part was feasibility. And then the second part, we wanted to gather the first pediatric computational modeling data, because there's no prior literature on any pediatric imaging uh, in this population of patients, um, to enable larger, large-scale studies to look at what are the progressive changes in vascular uh, parameters, wall shear stress and oscillatory shear index, as a person goes from a healthy artery with no uh, vascular disease to an artery that has an established plaque. How does that change? So um, this was an IRB-approved study. We ended up getting 20 kids from the diabetic clinic. They were between the ages of 12 and 18. They had to have at least a two-year history of type 1 diabetes. Um, they were excluded if they couldn't do an MRI scan, so if they were extremely claustrophobic, they were excluded. They couldn't have any other risk factors for atherosclerosis, no hyperlipidemia, no hypertension, no metabolic syndrome, no smoking. And then we got age match controls from kids I was scanning anyway for clinical um, need, but the healthy controls could not have any risk factors for atherosclerosis and couldn't be on any medications that might modify risk. Um, this little cartoon tells you how our day went. It was a very early day. Um, we got consent in the clinic. Uh, bef when I was up in the diabetes clinic screening the charts, I would consent the patients. They met me at the bright hour of 6 o'clock in the morning, which is a lot to ask a teenager who would rather sleep in. Uh, and so we paid them $25, each of the kids, uh, for their trouble. Um, we did four limb blood pressure assessments and then put them in the scanner um, and used a 1.5 Tesla Siemens magnet. Um, the scan took about an hour. Uh, then I walked them upstairs and we used the mobile uh, brachial artery testing equipment from Freydert. Um, and I had one of the techs come over from Freydert. They got a venipuncture thereafter and then they went home. Um, we sent data that was anonymized to Marquette's lab for CFD modeling shortly thereafter. And our MRI protocol, I know some of this may be Greek to you, but the first part of it, just suffi suffice it to say, was to confirm normal anatomy. My IRB said to me, how do you know these diabetic kids are really normal? And so they required that we did a clinical scan um, to show them anatomy is normal. And then the uh, data that John needed was the navigated, uh, uh, respiratory navigated non gadolinium enhanced 3D image of the aortic arch primarily to include the brachiocephalic vessels. And then we gave him flow data, the total scan time 45 minutes to an hour. Um, kind of a busy slide. Uh, we decided to, uh, 20 patients was a lot to ask uh, for modeling on. It's just a lot of uh, computer power and a lot of time on the part of a number of people. And so uh, we randomly sent uh, nine patients who had diabetes and seven patients who had controls. John used, um, and I'm a clinician, so any questions about Simvas software, you have to ask John. He used the Simvascular software package to, again, make these little tetrahedron uh, models so to kind of um, segment this so that you could apply your mathematical equations in an area where flow was relatively constant. Um, 
He used the three, Kessel, uh, three element wind Kessel representation on the flow data uh, that we had provided for him, and then used resistances as noted in this table uh, to apply that. Um, we also just decided to do a quick and dirty what's the aortic compliance at the levels where we did flow. So we did a flow assessment. This is a coronal picture of a patient's heart, left ventricle out to the aorta. Uh, you do a flow assessment, and you can measure just a simple compliance or distensibility by measuring the area, the maximum area during systole multiplied by the, the minimum area um, and uh, using this formula with, if you know the blood pressure for the patient. Um, and that'll come and have some bearing momentarily, maybe. So this is a bit of a busy table, but suffice it to say that the kids were really very similar. Um, almost an even match between males and females for both diabetics and the um, controls. They had similar blood pressures. Uh, uh, there was no difference in heart rate or cardiac output, which is really important if you're trying to compare uh, wall shear stress. You'd like them to kind of be at the same physiologic state. The diabetic kids had, on average, uh, sadly, had diabetes for nine years. It's really kind of amazing. Um, quite, with quite a range. Um, all were on insulin. We had two additional ones on thyroid hormone. And the controls were from a number of different populations. We, um, our first control was a patient with Tetralogy of Fallot, and uh, we stopped using those patients because although they're our most frequent flyer at the scanner, some of them do have dilated aortas. And so uh, we felt like we would be critiqued as we submitted this for publication if we had too many that might have dilated aortas. So we went to uh, patients with chest wall deformities, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, but they didn't actually have it, um, a VSD, mild pulmonary stenosis, and an anomalous coronary that had been repaired. And so these kids uh, were consented as they came to the scanner. Um, again, another busy slide. Um, but. Most of the parameters were the same. The exceptions would be, obviously, the diabetics had higher glucose, 140 compared to 84. They had a little bit higher triglyceride, but not clinically meaningful, 87 versus 48. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, obviously, they're diabetic. It's quite high because their glucose is not in control, so it just proves that they're diabetic. Um, their inflammatory markers were not different. Pretty small cohort in a young population that's not unheard of. But interestingly, their flow-mediated dilation by brachial artery reactivity was different and was um, uh, low, as you might expect in a patient population that has uh, disease. And this was um, supported by other people's literature. Um, and uh, it negatively correlated with the years post-diagnosis. So the longer you have diabetes, the more unhealthy your vessel is, and it dilates less. Uh, it did not, however, correlate with aortic distensibility or time average wall shear stress or OSI. And we were initially sort of disturbed by that, but this is a really small study. You know, there's 20 patients, and um, we only modeled nine of them. Um, you know, in industry, we would do drug trials that were 6,000 patients. So it doesn't mean there's not a signal. It just means the cohort was pretty small. Um, looking at our time average wall shear stress, if we looked at the global time average wall shear stress for the ascending aorta, um, there really was no difference. There was a trend in the descending thoracic aorta, um, but it still didn't meet significance and no difference in the OSI. Again, initially we were all kind of disappointed, but if you look at the pictures, they look very different. This is a patient, and you can see a lot of red, a lot of high time average wall shear stress, and the control less so. So um, I asked John um, to uh, look at, and this is another patient, same thing, um, time average wall, sh wall shear stress looks a little bit higher in the patient. Um, and so I just, we talked about it, and, and John agreed that he would look at it at different segments and really um, investigate this further. So we um, investigated this using different locations, just like that one uh, article I talked about, and we decided to use the diameter of the descending thoracic aorta as the dimension that was going to separate each of these lines. Um, we used the left subclavian artery as the uh, reference point. Anything that was positive was below the left subclavian. Anything uh, that was negative was uh, at a slice closer to the aortic valve. Um, and then we looked at different regions, um, dividing the aorta. This is supposed to represent the aorta. So a right dimension, the outer wall, the left dimension, and the inner wall. Um, this is going to be a busy slide, so we'll have a second one that will show you this a little bit larger. But suffice it to say, each of the quadrants is represented by one of the graphs. One, <coughs> two, three, four segments. These are the um, controls on the top and the diabetics on the bottom. You can see they qualitatively look very different. And in the red lines are the diabetics. Um, so they did have um, areas of time average wall shear stress in many regions that were seemingly different. Um, these are, so along the right, the left, outer, and to a lesser degree, the inner curvatures of the aorta, the median time average wall shear stress at each location for the diabetics uh, was higher than the median for the controls reaching significance in two locations, okay? 
And for those who couldn't see that, a little bit bigger, you can just see somewhat different. Again, um, these are the different locations around the aorta, and these are the different quadrants. Right? So kind of interesting. And yet, it was a little disappointing, right? Because plaque has low time average wall shear stress. But these are kids, and uh, in uh, my world, Things change. Children grow into adults. There's a lot of vascular changes that can happen. So the question I have is, what is the dynamic change in time average wall shear stress? And so I, I think this may exactly be what's happening with these children. Uh, the oscillatory shear index, um, same kind of thing, um, really no significant difference except at two areas that are starred. Okay. So our results, our pilot study is unique in that it's the first time CMR CFD modeling is used to study central vasculature in a young diabetic population who's at risk for premature atherosclerosis, showing that it's really feasible to characterize regional differences in the vascular uh, parameters of time average wall shear stress. They appeared to be heterogeneous changes. Um, in this early phase, the impact of regional time average wall shear stress may not be detected by the global um, uh, distensibility marker that we had because that really wasn't any different. But, and recall then this low time average wall shear stress and high oscillatory shear index in the adult studies, that was what they think promotes atherogenesis. So I wonder uh, whether there's serial change in these parameters with aging. And this is not known. There's no literature on that at all. Um, so our ongoing research efforts and future directions, I'll take the last 10 minutes or so to wrap this up. Um, ongoing research um, through the efforts uh, led by uh, Dr. Ladisa, um, there have been a number of efforts to refine the computational modeling, which uh, really makes sense to even me, the clinician who's not an engineer. You have to take into account what's the aortic valve morphology and what is the actual waveform for a patient. So um, we just published this paper looking at incorporating the aortic valve into the models uh, so that it's not just a um, uh, the same sort of flow pattern for every patient, but rather it's defined by the patient's flow. Um, and then uh, we looked at the impact of motion. You know, the heart's moving up and down, the valve moves up and down, our flow parameters, it's just really kind of a complicated situation. So that's uh, been submitted for publication. Um, we are looking at patients with disease. We've certainly done coarctation patients. We've looked at some Marfan patients, and um, uh, that is a manuscript that's in preparation on uh, Marfan patients have a connective tissue disease, and their aorta dilates and dilates until it actually can rupture. And so we've done some modeling on what are the wall shear stress factors that might be associated with dilatation. Um, and then um, we have a, a healthy study of, uh, some of you may have volunteered for this, of Marquette students actually, looking at how does flow vary with exercise. And um, very interesting, Laura Elwin with uh, John and uh, a couple of the folks at Freighter made a bicycle that was MRI compatible. I had to go through our engineering group to make sure that we could use it in a clinical scanner. And it's made out of wood and plastic. And the, Volunteers laid on the scanner and pedaled, uh, and uh, we imaged them while they were pedaling, and it uh, took a lot of uh, finagling because your knees hit the bore of the magnet, so we had to look at what is the difference of scanning off isocenter. So a lot of engineering goes into some of these projects, and uh, I can't thank John and his group enough for assisting me with learning about uh, how to use MRI uh, uh, to a greater um, uh, extent than I'm currently doing it. I would say that we would probably um, consider a longitudinal MRI study, uh, computational study of diabetic patients to understand aorta compliance as well as these regional changes in atherosclerotic risk. How does it change as the patients age? And you know, the patients that we scanned, we scanned them five years ago. So, uh, so they're now in their, some of them are in their 20s. And tapping upon them or patients in the adult, young adults with, athros with uh, diabetes would be very interesting to understand how do these changes happen, and um, one could even imagine randomizing them to those patients who receive uh, lipid-lowering agents and not lipid-lowering agents, or good diabetic control, not good diabetic control, just based on the patient's lack of compliance. How does that affect your time average wall shear stress and plaque? Uh, so very interesting. I could imagine 20 years from now, when I'm retired and my child is maybe going to engineering school, that one could use CMR studies of congenital heart disease, yes, to get anatomy, but maybe to include computational modeling on all of them to allow us to understand flow, wall shear stress, and oscillatory shear index, and then allow a better understanding of the complications that happen from surgery or from disease and perhaps aiding in uh, intervention as shown with that early Fontan picture. And furthermore, I could even imagine a CMR clinical scan might have a time average wall shear st stress OSI score where we give you a score and help you to predict what's your risk for atherosclerosis. And then we try to modify 
uh, that risk by uh, giving you a, a medication. Uh, you know, many people are on statins. How does that affect your uh, regional wall motion uh, and wall parameters for plaque? So in closing, I'd like to thank um, John, certainly, and all of your colleagues here at Marquette. It's been a really wonderful uh, collaboration. Um, Pippa Simpson in the Quantitative Health Sciences has helped us to look at uh, loads of data, and uh, I wouldn't be able to do it without her. Um, Raman Almazade is a diabetologist from whom we got the diabetic kids. Mike Widlansky runs the vascular lab at Freydert. Uh, Sheila um, Ivins uh, developed the bicycle. Um, uh, Joe Cava is my colleague in imaging. Joe Camarda was one of our fellows, and he's working on the Marfan project and is now um, working at Children's Memorial in Chicago. So a lot of effort goes into these research activities, and if there are any of you that would like to collaborate, I certainly would love to keep things moving along. Thank you.